Good morning. Welcome to chapel. Um, thank you all for coming to worship with us. We're excited you're here. Um, I'm just going to start off with uh, Mark 9:38, which says, uh, Teacher, said John, we saw someone driving out demons in your name, and we told him to stop because he was not one of us. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. For whoever is not against us is for us. And I want to encourage us all to remember that we don't have to defend God. <laughs> he is him all by himself. Um, and standing in the truth that he is and Christ is and all that we know and have experienced of him is more than enough. Loving others is more than enough. Um, so just be reminded of that truth. If you will stand and worship with us.
a God who eats, there's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of suffering. So imagine you are distant and removed, but you chase us down in merciful pursuit.
reaching out to make me whole. The one who put death in its place. His life is flowing through my veins. His life is flowing through my veins. And I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God. so grateful for this privilege we have to learn about your name, to hear about your name, to proclaim your name in this place. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that our hearts will be open to your truth forever and ever. Amen. I will have Sister Modica. Well, many thanks to our chapel worship team that leads so faithfully each and every week. Thank you so much. Well, good morning and welcome to chapel. Before I formally introduce this chapel series that we're embarking upon this morning and today's speaker, I would like to remind everyone that if you have a prayer request, you can use it, you can share it using the QR code. If you go out into the lobby area, you'll see the QR code on the dais. If you have a prayer request that you'd like to submit to the Office of Faith and Practice, um, we will pray for that request. We also share it with the President's Office and our prayer ministry. It can be done anonymously and so forth. So uh, thank you to Mackenzie again for providing that to our community. So every Wednesday when you come, if there's a prayer request, you can certainly just quickly put it in the QR code and know somebody's praying for you. As one friend noted during the COVID-19 pandemic that, quote, anxiety is the water that we're swimming in now. 
According to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America's research in 2020, anxiety is the most common mental challenge in the United States affecting roughly 40 million adults. So, as a Christ-centered, diverse community anchored in faith, reason, and justice, it is imperative to ask what resources does the Christian tradition provide as we grapple with this phenomenon. So, we're going to spend the next few weeks with those who have studied the topic of anxiety from many different angles, biblical, theological, psychological, and the therapeutic, Thus, this chapel series, and I hope you come to each one especially, is one of deep listening to what the Spirit wants to tell us as a community and also how the Spirit will shape us as a community. So please keep your ears and hearts open during this chapel series. If I remember correctly, it was a cold and cloudy day in mid-November of 2013 in Baltimore, Maryland, when I first met our chapel speaker. Dr. Carey, Dr. Flett, and I were tasked with interviewing candidates for an open position in biblical studies here at the university, and we did so at the annual Society of Biblical Literature Conference, a renowned conference with over 5,000 scholars in attendance. But here's the key, we only had 20 minute slots for each potential candidate to see if they would be a viable option to bring onto campus for a further interview. We had our set questions that we would ask, and I think we interviewed 20 different candidates in one day. When, our, when this morning's chapel speaker entered the makeshift interview lounge, she was prepared, engaging, and, and, and creative. She even brought with her syllabi of courses that she could teach here at Eastern University. I said to myself quietly, I think we're finished now. Dr. Rhonda Burnett Bletch, also known as Dr. Beebe, is Professor of Biblical Studies and Department Chair of Theology. She began her teaching at Eastern University in the fall of 2014 after a distinguished teaching career at Greensboro College in North Carolina, and we're so glad she is here. She's an engaging, caring, and pastoral scholar of the scriptures, to sit in Dr. Beebe's classroom is to learn from someone who has encountered God in spirit and in the scriptures. A beautiful combination to behold. Would you please welcome this morning our very own Dr. Beebe. Good morning. Um, first, I want to thank our praise and worship team for their beautiful music this morning. That was really, really incredible. I know that they put in long hours of practice each week in order to lead us in worship, and they really do it so well. But like all of you, like all Eastern students, they have a lot to do, right? <laughs> they attend classes, they do homework, they write papers, they study, they take tests, maybe they hold down jobs at the same time, um, participate in sports and extracurricular activities. And if there's any time left over, maybe they even have a social life, maybe. It never really ceases to amaze me how busy the lives of students are. Likewise, Eastern's employees are pretty busy too. Um, we look, work long hours, we attend countless meetings. We teach overloads, serve on committees, conduct research. We take work home in the evenings. We take on additional tasks whenever we're asked. And if I'm honest, sometimes we have trouble saying no, even when we probably should. There's just so much that contributes to the busyness and anxiety of our lives. And since the onset of the COVID pandemic, We've been asked to do all these things under unusual and unpredictable circumstances. I can't really imagine a better recipe for anxiety. Dr. Modica already mentioned some really alarming statistics this morning, and he's right. All the evidence suggests that anxiety is a top concern among college students and educators. 
One recent study by the Boston University School of Public Health analyzed mental health data collected from 2013 to 2021 among 350,000 college students at over 300 campuses. And it found a 110% increase in anxiety over the course of those years. It's pretty scary. Anecdotally, from my own courses and interactions with students, I can say that the levels of anxiety are much higher now than they were just a few years ago. So when Dr. Modiga asked me if I'd speak in this chapel series, I knew that this was a really vital topic for our community. Um, specifically, as a biblical scholar, I was asked to address what scripture has to say about anxiety. But before I do that, by way of disclaimer, I want to make it clear that I am not suggesting that people who suffer, especially from clinical anxiety, can pray that away or read the Bible and cure themselves from anxiety. Um, clinical anxiety is a mental health disorder that requires counseling and often medication as well. So I pray that anyone so affected seek the medical and psychological help that they need in addition to searching the scriptures. It's not an either or proposition. I also want to reassure you, just in case anybody's wondering, that the Bible does not in any way suggest that anxiety is an indication of sin. Everybody gets anxious. Christians get anxious. Uh, followers of Jesus are not immune to anxiety. Feeling anxious is not a sign that your faith is defi deficient in any way. Um, but because the Christian life is so often described as a life of peace, sometimes if we don't feel that peace, we worry that maybe there's something wrong with us. Maybe there's something wrong with our faith. And then we feel guilty about feeling anxious. And then that, that's just a terrible spiral of worry and guilt. So don't worry, anxiety is not an indication of sin. As I searched the scriptures this week for passages about anxiety, I was really blown away by the embarrassment of riches in front of me. The Bible has a lot to say about anxiety. The psalmist tells us, do not fret, it only causes harm. Other psalms offer promises, such as, when my anxiety was great within me, your consolation, O God, brought joy to my soul. The prophets proclaim, say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. With recompense, he will come and save you. Or one of my personal favorites, I will keep you in perfect peace who mind, whose minds are stayed on me because they trust in me. Jesus teaches in the Gospel of Matthew, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. Which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My own peace I give you. I do not give it as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. The New Testament epistles also have things to say about anxiety. Cast all your anxieties upon him, because he cares for you. Scripture has a lot to say on this topic, and obviously I can't even begin to cover it all. So I've decided to focus my remarks this morning on four short verses in the Apostle Paul's letter to Philippi. This is Philippians 4, verses 4 to 8. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, present your request to God with thanksgiving. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Do not be anxious about anything. You might be wondering whether Paul is expressing unreasonable expectations in this passage. Don't be anxious about anything? 
Maybe he meant to say, be anxious for less, or only be anxious on Tuesdays. I think maybe I could do that, maybe. Um, but a little knowledge of Greek helps us better understand what Paul is actually saying here. He wrote this text in the present active tense, which implies an ongoing state. So Paul is actually saying something like, do not live under the constant shadow of anxiety. Do not be continually anxious. In other words, Paul recognizes that the presence of anxiety is a normal part of the human experience. But the prison of anxiety is not God's will for our lives. This much is clear. It is not God's will that we live lives of perpetual anxiety. It is not our maker's will that we face each day with dread and trepidation. If anybody ever had reason to live under dread and trepidation, it was the Apostle Paul. While writing this letter to Philippi, Paul was in prison. It's difficult to know exactly where because Paul was in prison a lot for preaching the gospel. But many scholars date this letter near the end of his Roman imprisonment around 62 CE. So let your imaginations transport you back roughly 2,000 years. Envision Paul as a 60-year-old man having spent 30 years on the road as a Christian missionary. His back is bent by miles and by beatings endured. He um, had received 39 lashes on five different occasions. He was beaten by rods at least three times. He'd endured shipwrecks and storms. He currently awaits trial before the Roman emperor. Nero, unfortunately, has learned that he can curry favor with the Roman citizens by killing Christian believers, of which Paul is the best known. So his outlook is not great. But Paul's mind is on his churches, many of which are bickering or being led astray by false teachers. And this man is telling us not to worry, not to feel anxious. Incredibly, Paul's letter to the Philippians contains not one word of fear or complaint. Not one word. Instead, he lifts up his thanks to God, calling on his hearers to do the same. And he offers a little practical advice in these verses on how to avoid the prison of anxiety. He tells us here his secret of being content, no matter what the external circumstances. I'm going to borrow from author and minister Max Lucado a convenient mnemonic device to help us learn and remember Paul's advice in this passage. That device is the four letters C-A-L-M, which, which represent and restate Paul's admonitions in this passage. Celebrate, rejoice always, ask for what you need, leave your concerns with God, and meditate on good things. Celebrate, ask for what you need, leave your concerns with God, and meditate on good things. So let's start with celebrate. Did you notice Paul's emphasis on celebration in this passage? Right up front, the apostles' prescription for anxiety begins with a call to rejoice. Paul uses every tool in the box to make sure we get this, to call our attention to rejoicing in this verse. First, he uses a present imperative tense, so his readers will hear him say, continually, habitually rejoice. And in case the verb tense isn't enough, he removes any expiration date. Rejoice always. And then, perchance we didn't get it, he repeats himself. Again, I say rejoice. I think it's kind of important. Have you ever noticed that when we focus on our problems, they seem to get bigger? Anxiety causes us to magnify the negative and dismiss the positive. The more we look to God, the more our problems are reduced to their proper size. 
That's why the psalmist says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. That's why Peter was able to step out of that boat in faith as long as he kept his eyes on Jesus. He could walk on the waters. But he began to sink when he focused on the impossibility of his circumstances. However, this rejoice in the Lord is not a call to feel happy or to always have an upbeat attitude. Right? That would be impossible, ultimately not very helpful. It might even make you annoying to be around. Don't want to do that. Paul's admonition here is not a call to feel a certain way. It's a call to intentionally live each day out of the deeply rooted confidence that God exists, God is good, and God is in control. Anxiety is often the product of perceived chaos. We sense that we're victims of unseen, turbulent, random forces beyond our control. And the less we feel in control of our circumstances, the more anxious we get. The more we try to control our circumstances, the more we realize we can't. We can't take control because control is not ours to take. Control of the universe belongs to God alone. We also need to remember that God's sovereignty isn't a guarantee that our lives will be trouble-free. Remember, Paul was in chains when he wrote these words. But he insists that his current imprisonment was working out the furtherance of the gospel because his presence in Rome had enabled him to preach to the palace guard. Paul was well aware that following God did not guarantee one a trouble-free life. But to read his letter to the Philippians is to read the words of a man who in the innermost parts of his being believed in the steady hand of a good and sovereign God. Likewise, in the 8th century, the prophet Isaiah recognized that an age of peace and security had just abruptly come to an end with the death of King Uzziah. But rather than panic, Isaiah describes a vision that he had in the temple of the heavenly throne room. He sees the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, surrounded by seraphim, and the train of his robe fills the temple. God's answer for troubled times has always been the same. No matter what is happening on earth, heaven has an occupied throne. Now, God's sovereignty does not guarantee a trouble-free life. Remember Joseph, who was sold by jealous brothers into slavery, wrongly accused and imprisoned for a crime he didn't commit? Like Paul, Joseph refused to give up. He became a model prisoner and was entrusted with extra responsibilities. Yay, just what we all want. And as prisoner in charge, he did a favor for the royal butler, hoping that that butler would put in a good word for him with Pharaoh. Even then, two more years pass with Joseph in prison, two years without a word. Do you think Joseph felt anxious? Do you think he wondered if he would always be in prison? Do you think he wondered if whether God had forgotten him? Maybe he did. But years later, as an official over the granaries of Egypt during a time of famine, he had learned to view his sufferings through the lens of divine sovereignty. He would tell his brothers, you intended me harm, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Two words are really, really important in that verse. But God. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. Joseph's brothers intended evil toward him, but God can reroute evil into good. God can use all things to bring about his purpose. The ultimate illustration of this is Jesus' death on the cross. Even this evil deed God used for good, taking the crucifixion of Friday and turning it into the resurrection of Sunday. So celebrate because God can do that for us, too. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. 
Paul also advises his listeners to let their gentleness be evident to all, to present their requests to God with thanksgiving. We're moving on to the ask. Um, the Greek word that is translated gentleness here describes a temperament that is seasoned and mature. It envisions an attitude that is fitting to the occasion, level-headed, um, even-tempered. Its opposite would be to overreact to everything or to panic. Note that this gentleness is evident to all. People notice. The gentle person has a contagious calm. They constantly remind others that God is in control. These are tough times, but we'll get through them. That kind of calm is possible precisely because God is near. Therefore, we need not live under the constant shadow of anxiety. It's been said that fear triggers either despair or prayer. Next time, before striking out in fear or giving in to despair, Let's turn to God for help and remember that we're not alone. However, remember, asking God for help doesn't mean that the problem will resolve immediately. Sometimes we get an advanced course in patience. That's good, too. But God has promised to be present with us. God is near, and God wants to hear from us. God loves the sounds of our voice. God is not like the unjust judge who only grants justice to that persistent widow because she badgers him for weeks. God is more like a loving father who wants to give his beloved children good things. So pray through your problems and make your requests known to God. Cast all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. To cast something is to relocate it from one place to another. When we cast our anxieties on God, we have to let it go. Um, we have to leave it with God. Leave it with God. That's hard for me. Those of you who know me well will know that one of my few faults is being a bit of a backseat driver. <laughs> my, my husband can confirm this. Um, I hate highway driving. So whenever we take a family trip, I insist that he sit in the driver's seat. I'm always eager for him to take the wheel. But in my heart of hearts, I know that he needs my help, <laughs> right? I am convinced that my husband is too easily distracted. He likes to look at the scenery or fiddle with the radio or have a conversation, and he just needs my help to pay attention. So it's my job to draw his attention to the cars that are driving erratically, changing lane to lane or braking suddenly in front of us. And the best way to do that is, of course, to gasp really loudly, you know, <laughs> or grab hold of the armrest with a death grip or to shout out useful instructions like, watch out! You know, I do my part. But after a couple of hours into every trip, my long-suffering husband eventually grits out, will you just let me drive the car? After we've made our requests known to God, we need to trust God to drive the car. If you're like me, this is the hard part. It's hard to ask God to deal with a problem without following that up with, um, God, are you sure you want to deal with it that way? Wouldn't this be better? We have our own ideas about what we want that solution to look like. For example, most of us would like our anxieties to disappear overnight, right? For us suddenly to become brave and confident and capable with little to no effort on our own part, that would be great. But God might have other ideas. And when that happens, it can be tempting to reclaim that driver's seat. The Bible's most common term for worry is a compound word consisting of the verb to divide and the noun the mind. To be anxious, then, is to have a divided mind. Anxiety chops up our thoughts and our energy and our focus um, it sends our awareness in a dozen different directions. We worry about the past, what we did or said yesterday or last week. We worry about the future. What is that assignment going to be like, that test, that game that's coming up? Anxiety takes us away from right now. It takes our attention away from right now and directs it to back then or up there. 
It keeps us from being present in the moment, which is really all we have been promised. When we leave our promises with God, we might find that suddenly we have more brain space. Suddenly it's easier to be in the present moment without worrying about the past or the future. A wise person once said that the good life begins not when circumstances change, but when our attitude toward them changes. Thanksgiving, an attitude of gratitude, focuses our mindful attention on the good things in our lives. The anxious heart says, oh God, if only I had that, or I could do this, then I would be happy. But the grateful heart says, oh wow, look at all you've given me, God. You've given me this and that. Thank you so much, God. Worry and gratitude have a hard time sharing your heart. Right? If you fill your heart with gratitude, there won't be much room left over for worry. Finally, Paul suggests that his hearers quell anxiety by meditating on good things. We, can't, we can control what gets to take up space in our minds. We can't always control our circumstances but we can control what we think about them. Or to put it more directly, life will persist in giving us lemons, but we don't have to suck on them, right? Healing from anxiety requires healthy thinking. And it can be really hard to learn new habits of thinking. Sometimes we need help with that, and that's okay. Meditate on good things. I wonder what Paul was thinking about as he sat in that Roman prison cell. Here's an interesting detail about his letter to the Philippians. Within its 104 verses, Paul mentions Jesus 40 times. That's an average of every two and a half verses. So fix your mind on Jesus. Abide in him. Count your blessings. Make the decision to interpret each blessing as a, a sign of God's presence and care. Now let's see if the mnemonic device worked. Can you tell me what C-A-L-M stands for? C, celebrate. A, awesome. L, leave your concerns with God, great. And M, meditate on good things. So if you guys get an A. Good job. Um, so the next time you feel anxious, don't fall into the trap of fatalistic thinking. Don't try to handle it all on your own. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. It's not your job to know every detail of the future. It is your job to hold on to the hand of the one who does and never, ever let go. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, let God, all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Go forth from this place and let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Amen.